Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a companion video. Now, what are companion videos? Well, I'm glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we save a little bit of time and take live questions from the audience. But quite often, we don't have time to get around to all the live questions that get sent in. I want to make sure those questions get answered in a video, so I gather them up and we address them here on companion videos. And this is Wednesday, May the 1st, so these are going to be the leftover questions from this morning's John Campia Show on Wednesday, the May 1st. So let's not waste any time and get right to it. And we're going to start things off today with Logic Chills who writes, have you watched the OG Karate Kid and the new Cobra Kai series? I, yes to both. At least I watched the first five episodes of the new, the uh, Cobra Kai series. I, of course, I grew up watching that Karate Kid movie, so there's that. I do not like the Cobra Kai series. I watched five episodes of it. I know a lot of you guys love it, and that's awesome. My wife, Anne, loves it. I thought it was garbage. I thought it was just un insufferable garbage. I could not watch it, but a lot of other people like it. My wife loves it. A lot of you guys love it, and that's great. I, I, I'm okay being the odd man out on that. Uh, Starkiller writes, but wasn't the first Jedi Order Grey Jedi? No, as a matter of fact, they weren't. As a matter of fact, Grey Jedi are not in canon at all. There's no such thing as gray Jedi in canon. So a lot of people confuse that and they think there's actually gray Jedi in canon. There is actually not. No gray Jedi in canon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, James uh, Claysman writes, one of two. I think Black Panther released the weekend of President's Day. Some people get off from work. The Force Awakens opened the week before Christmas. Uh, and then it looks, says one of two. I'm not sure if it would have mattered with a three-hour movie like Endgame, but I am sure it helps the other two movies. Yeah, and actually, we've already talked about that a couple of times, James, is that, you know, uh, Endgame was the number three all-time opening Monday record. Uh, Black Panther's number one, The Force Awakens number two, and then uh, Endgame was number three, which is remarkable for a three-hour movie. It, remarkable. Now, a lot of people will point out that, oh, you know, those other ones, there was a holiday for a lot of people on those other two movies for Black Panther and for The Force Awakens. And that's true. And that's a contributing factor. Absolutely. I still think the bigger factor is the fact that it's a three hour movie. Because you know how they say, look, with Saturdays and Sundays, you can have up to nine screenings, minus one screening because of the length of the movie, you still got eight. On Mondays, you know, you've had a possibility of two screening or three screenings reduced down to two. That's like 30%. I think that had a big effect. So I think there's a lot of different factors that went into it. I just think that's probably the biggest one, but definitely the holiday Monday for a lot of people, those other two, absolutely those are contributing factors as well, no doubt about it. Uh, Frab Nab writes, over under 35%, King Kong plays a part in Godzilla, King of the Monsters. It depends by what you mean by plays a part. Do you mean he's mentioned or referenced? Then probably higher. But if you actually mean plays a tangible material part in the film, like comes in at the end and get, takes part in one of the fights. I'm going to go under 35%. It's not 5%, not 10%, but 35% seems a little bit high. I'm going to take under on that. Uh, let's see. Jeremiah writes, I know you aren't a big, uh, you aren't a big on theory crafting videos, but would, but would consider doing one with Endgame storylines phase four. Also, Ashley is just so wonderful. You guys are all wonderful. Well, thank you, Jeremiah. Um, I, I don't know about doing a theory crafting video. Like, I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, phase four storylines and things like that as we move forward. But I don't know that I would actually do like a theory crafting video on that. That's not generally my thing. It's not that I'd never done it nor that I would never will do it. But I don't really think that I will. I don't think that I will at this point. Now, as far as Ashley, she is wonderful. But I keep telling you guys, appreciate Ashley while we've got her because she is a working model and a working actress and she gets a lot of gigs and there's going to come a time when she just won't have time to do this show anymore. So all I'm saying is appreciate Ashley while we got her because I don't know how long we will, but she is pretty great on this show, isn't she? I like having her around. Uh, anyway, Jack Drees writes, Hey, John, got any new Funko Pops this year? Just got an Alex Trebek. Nice. The other day, the box has wear and tear. I don't care. I wanted it. As a matter of fact, Ann and I were just in um, Riverside, California, and we were at a mall out there, and there were a couple... No, 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 no. Sorry, I take that back. I got them at uh, Barnes & Noble in Burbank. That's where we were. Me, Ann, and Ray were at a, a Barnes & Noble in Burbank. That's where we were. And they had a sale on, like, pops were like eight bucks. 
So I bought three, and I can't remember what the third one is. This was just like two or three days ago. I bought a new Aquaman one, um, the um, the Jason Momoa one, but there's a new one out, and I so I got that. I got a Boromir one, which is my favorite character in all of literature. Uh, he's, of course, from Lord of the Rings. So I got a Boromir one and Boromir. And I cannot remember. What was the third one I got? For the life of me, right now, I can't remember what the third one was I got. I got to go. It's still sitting in the. That's how recently I got it. It's still sitting in the bag down in our entryway. Uh, so I still, I, I did. I've gotten a few more. I've gotten a few more. A lot easier to buy than hot toys. That's for sure. All right. Uh, Joser Mays writes, when are we getting the trailer for Far From Home? Uh, well. We have had a trailer for Far From Home for quite a while. Do you mean another trailer? Eh, probably after next weekend sometime. Remember, the movie's still two months away. Uh, they want Endgame to probably just get all the attention right now. I, I'm, I'm going to guess we're going to get another Spider-Man trailer probably in the next two to three weeks. But if you didn't know, we do have one out already. Just hop on YouTube and do a quick search for that, Joser. All right, James Klassman, or Klaisman writes, Sorry, previous Super Chats were about the money boxes. Oh, no, 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 man, I totally understand. Don't worry, man, I totally got where you were coming from. No worries. But thank you for clarifying just in case I didn't. That was very considerate of you, James. All right, Ed Matthews writes, At my screen, casual moviegoers were confused and upset that the Far From Home trailer was attached to Avengers 4. Do you think showing... Uh, that right before Avengers 4 affected the impact of Infinity War for average viewers who might not have known about Far From Home. No. it Look, it was blatant public knowledge that Far From Home was coming. The trailers came out months ago. It's been on the front page of magazines. It's almost like saying, okay, I was going to watch the... Uh, some guy living in New England says, I was going to watch the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, it, new, the Patriots just won the Super Bowl again. So <clears throat> I was going to watch the Super Bowl, but I couldn't watch when I got there. And I was busy all week, so I didn't watch it all week. Meanwhile, it's on every news channel. There was a parade in New England. People gave people at work the days off work. It was public knowledge. It was public knowledge. Look, with Spider-Man Far From Home, there have been news announcements, press conferences. There have been covers of magazines. There have been like publicly released trailers. At some point, you got to go, but what if somebody lives in a cave and didn't know? Well, too bad. I mean, they put out the trailers because they wanted the public to know uh, about it. So, no, they shouldn't. You don't put out a trailer and go... Oh, but maybe we shouldn't show the trailer. Well, what you put out a trailer so people will see it. You don't go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we shouldn't show the trailer in case somebody hasn't seen it. Well, the whole point of the trailer is to have people see it. So play the damn trailer, right? So no, I, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe they should have, you know, coddled certain small percentage of people. It, it, the studio wanted the trailer out there. To them, that's not a spoiler. That's all that counts. So now, nah, I mean, just, maybe there are some people who were living under a rock and they didn't know. Okay, fine. But they were meant to know. So, no, I, I, I think it's absolutely appropriate that they play that trailer completely. Uh, Dennis Haina writes, one of two. Hey, John, you've often said that one director shouldn't stay on a given franchise for too long. Given the Russo success in the MCU, has your mind been changed or are there or are they the exception that proves the rule? Well, there's a couple things to keep in mind about that. Like I have this I have a preference. It's not a 100 percent locked in stone rule, but I have a preference that a director not stay on one property for too long because we've seen multiple examples of where by the time they get into the third films, they often will start to lose their creative juices because they've just been on the same thing for so long. Uh, we've seen it happen with Sam Raimi and Spider-Man. We saw it happen even with uh, Christopher Nolan by the third Batman film, which was still a good film, but it was easily the least good out of the three Batman films he's did. And we've seen it multiple times. But there's a couple of different situations here. Number one, when it comes to the MCU, the real guy in charge is Kevin Feige. I'm not taking anything away from what the Russos did, but they have to get approval from and get the guidance hands of everything that comes from Kevin Feige. So there's that. The second thing to keep in mind is that these weren't just their own universe films. This is These are films that they directed that were built on the shoulders of other directors' work before them. So that makes it a little bit different too. But also this... Just because I think it's a good idea, let's take a basketball analogy. It's not a good idea to heave up a half-court shot. You'll miss nine times out of ten. But if the clock is kicking down 
and you've got it at half court and you heave it up, it can go in. There's still a possibility it goes in and it can still work. So I don't think it's, there's an ironclad rule that says if a director ever stays on a movie for more than two or three films, they automatically start getting bad. No, not at all. But I think there's enough examples that go, you should be cautious of that. So that's why I still have a preference that directors move on. But there are examples of directors staying on and it works. It can work. It's not like it's an automatic failure. But even then in the MCU with the Russo brothers, I believe there are some extenuating circumstances, primarily being Kevin Feige and the work of other directors. But, but hey, they stayed on and it worked and that's awesome. But I still generally feel like a director to keep themselves sharp and fresh should move on to different properties. And, and I'm super thrilled for the Russo brothers now that they've said this is their last MCU film. And then maybe they'll come back someday and do another one down the road, but they have no plans to do another one. And now they're going to start flexing their creative muscles, doing other things. And I think that's great for them. And I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. Uh, anyway, Christopher Sanchez writes, uh, John, regarding my thoughts on the Oscars, my point was that there's a difference in what what is the better film versus what is your favorite, most enjoyable movie. To answer the second one, hashtag of Oscars is irrelevant. Well, the Oscars are not irrelevant. The Oscars are more relevant than just about anything else. They are the movie governing body that is filled with movie making professionals. Unless you're saying Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Christopher Nolan, uh, you know, uh, everybody, every good filmmaker, Quentin Tarantino, uh, on and on and on. Unless you're saying they're all irrelevant and they, their opinions mean nothing. If you're saying all of those guys and all the actors, Denzel Washington, uh, Tom Hanks, all them, none of their, they're just irrelevant. If you're saying all those film professionals who make movies for a living, the people who make up the Academy, if you're saying they're all irrelevant, then I don't know what to say to you. I, I just don't know what to say to you. Uh, that's fine with as far as the there's a difference between what is the better film versus what is your favorite film is there a difference is there I, I'm not saying there absolutely is I'm not saying there absolutely isn't but is there quite often I think sometimes I'll say there's a difference just to make up an excuse to say why I like one something over another I don't know <clears throat> I don't know if that's true or not I really don't I think many of us operate on the, the presumption that there's a difference between our favorite and what we think is the best. I know I often do, but I don't know if it's necessarily true, even though I myself will often operate on that assumption. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know that, but I think there's a deeper discussion to be had there because I think there's some fallacy in that, but I also think there's some truth in that. It's worthy of a deeper discussion, I think. Um, Ed uh, Matthews writes, just became a Patreon supporter today. Thank you so much, Ed. I've uh, been watching since AMC Closet days. Those were good days. I can't help but wonder what would Schnepp think about Endgame? Oh, there's no wondering with me. He would have loved that damn thing. He would have loved that damn thing. I mean, that, that was a movie that was kind of tailor-made for him to enjoy. <laughs> I mean, really, basically. I mean, the, the movie's a big ball of fan service in all the best ways possible. There's a lot of, of the great scenes and great shots in that movie that have nothing to do with the narrative flow. They're just there so the audience can get a big scream. And that's great. And I think there's a lot of things in there that Schnepp would have loved seeing. And I won't go into them in details because I don't want to give any spoilers away. Uh, but yeah, there's that. Oh, by the way, thank you for bringing this up, Ed. I should mention, I generally, when I do companion videos, I generally do not read the questions in advance, generally. But for the last couple of days, I have been just to make sure there's no spoiler questions in. And there were, sure enough, a couple of Avengers Endgame spo heavy spoiler questions and even a Game of Thrones heavy spoiler question. And I deleted those. Guys, you know better. Don't send in stuff that gives that the question itself reveals big spoilers for these movies. We're not at that point yet. We're not going to be at that point for a while. <coughs> so... Just to try to protect everybody else, I did go through the questions uh, for the last couple of days and today, and there were a couple I had to delete uh, just to protect everybody else because it wasn't fair to everybody else, just to let you guys know that full transparency. Uh, anyway, thanks for that, Matthew. I appreciate that. Uh, or Ed, I should say. Okay. Gabriel Reed writes, forget Hellstrom being back Backstrom. Forget Hellstrom being back Backstrom. There might be a whole bunch of people who know what being back Backstrom means. 
I'll be on, and maybe you're going, oh yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't have no idea what that means. I have no idea what that means. Then again, I don't read over the questions in advance or else I could have researched that, but I, I honestly don't know what that means. Sorry about that, Gabriel. But I'm sure there are other people watching this who know what you mean are, and are winking their, their eye at you right now. Uh, James Bonner writes, finally saw Endgame last night at the 6 p.m. showing. Theater not packed, but pretty damn full. And oh my God, that ending. I, I feel like a kid opening the glossy splash page to a new Avengers graphic novel. I'm telling you what, I, again, I'm not the biggest fan in the world of the first two hours. I thought it was okay. The first two hours were mediocre. Some very, very good high moments, some problematic moments for me. But that last hour, I have said it before. I will say it again. It is simply the greatest hour ever in comic book movie history. That last hour is just everything bonkers you can imagine and then some it, it was just nuts it's such i mean you almost lose your breath even thinking about it what they did in there james anyway i'm glad you finally had a chance to see it, james and i hope i hope james that when you got to go see it i hope your experience was relatively spoiler free i hope you were able to go in there mostly spoiler free i'll keep my fingers crossed that that's the experience you had okay rj mills writes it kind of annoys me channels already put up spoiler reviews for endgame the thursday it came out can they not wait a little longer hey guys listen you know my opinion on that i think people should wait longer to put up a spoiler review and i get it if you don't want to see the spoilers you don't have to watch it i get that but now you're arming a lot of people who haven't seen the movie yet with spoilers to go and spoil for other people but <clears throat> at the same time i I mean, I get it. There's a, there's a real, I get the reasoning behind doing it first. There's a big rush on YouTube uh, and I understand this. I do. There is a big race in the YouTube space to be the first or at least be among the first to get something up, be the first to get the review of that movie up, be the first to get that piece of news up, be the first to get the spoiler review up. There's a big race to do that. And, and there are numbers that come along with that. And technically speaking, the movie is out now. The movie's out. It's it's open in, in North American market. So technically speaking, I, I, at least they waited till the movie's out, right? So I pass no judgment on anybody who does. I wish they wouldn't. I ask that they don't, but I but no judgment for me on those that do because I understand the allure to doing it. And technically speaking, the movie is out in theaters. So no judgment. No judgment. I wish they wouldn't, but no judgment. Just like I wish people wouldn't own cats, but no judgment if you do. No judgment if you do. I just wish you didn't. You should get dogs because I'm a dog guy. Anyway, uh, but I, I, I feel you, RJ. I do. I completely feel you. Okay. TJ Thomas writes, uh, saw Longshot and loved it. So funny. I'm hearing nothing but good things about Longshot. That's the new one opening this weekend. That's going to get crushed by Endgame in its second weekend. But everybody I've talked to from at CinemaCon, they did a screening at CinemaCon a few weeks ago. I was under the weather and couldn't go to the screening, unfortunately. But all the delegates I talked to who did go to the screening all said they thought it was fantastic. I think the trailers have looked good. TJ, you clearly saw it and you enjoyed it. Thank you for sharing that with me. I'm going to go see it on Thursday night. Me and Ann are going to go out and see it on Thursday night. Looking forward to that. So thanks for sharing your thoughts, TJ. Appreciate that. All right. Tall Dude 3231 writes, Hi, John, Rob, and Ashley. New fan to the channel, watching for the past three months. Oh, good to have you around, tall dude. Thank you for being here. Um, added it to my routine slash gym. Uh, thanks for helping me through tough times. Dude, it's always awesome when the film fan community can have places for us to openly talk, discuss, chat movies and movie news and ideas and theories and odds and speculation. And it's always great when we can do that as film fans, man. And it's always good for me, too. I know when I'm, I'm feeling down in my life, whatever, getting involved, either listening to or reading or whatever, get involved in some great online movie discussion, takes my mind off things, puts my mind a little bit more at ease, refreshes the soul a bit, and lets me go off and face the real world problems I have with a little bit of a fresher perspective. It's always great, and I'm glad that you're a part of it, tall dude, and I hope you enjoy watching or listening to the show at the gym. Just make sure you're just listening to it when you're driving and not watching it. Uh, Nate Smith writes, after 10 years of pulling teeth uh, for my wife to see Avengers, an Avengers movie, she wanted to go to Endgame. She cried through the movie. I loved Endgame. Hey, man, a lot of people are having a fantastic experience with Endgame. That, I mean, it's, you know, I, I always say, particularly lately around this movie, movies are experiential events. Movies at their best are meant to be experiential events. And 
that last hour of Endgame is nothing if not an experience. Can we agree on that? That that last hour of Endgame, if nothing else, is one big massive experience. From thrills and chills, highs and lows, tears and whatever. I mean, it's just such an amazing experience. And I'm glad your wife had a good time, Nate. And I'm glad you got yourself a partner who goes to movies like that with you. That's awesome. I think we're lucky guys that way. Okay. Uh, UN uh, fits you. I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. Over under 35%. The end game makes over $200 million on its second weekend. That's a good question. I'm going to take under thir- under 35%. But remember this. Right now... Endgame is projected to make around 180 on its second weekend. That's huge. Obviously a record for biggest second weekend in history. At 180, that's not too far off from 200. <laughs> it's not too far off. So uh, I would say that is a definite possibility, but I think 35% is a little high of a number, so I'm going to take under 35%, but not by any stretch of imagination by saying if it's impossible. It's projected for 180. That's not too far from 200. So while I'll take under 35%, it's it's still got a pretty good crack at it. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Eustace Past Chalice writes, I had a major disagreement today about about the inflation. What is the fairest way to compare income? Um, greetings from Greece. P.S. Endgame broke records here. I've had this discussion many times, Eustace. It, it says some people say when a calculating a box office over the eras, you need to take into account inflation. And I'll say why. And they'll say because it's a changed variable the value of the dollar is a changed variable when it comes to adding that up. So therefore, you need to take inflation into consideration. My argument to that is simply this. There are many changed variables that affect what a movie makes at the box office over the years. Inflation is one for sure. But there's many other cultural and economic and societal changes that directly have an impact on our movie viewing habits. You can't just pick one variable and say, let's take the flat, even box office and then add in this one variable, inflation. Let's let's consider this one variable while ignoring all the other variables. You either consider all the variables or none of them, right? That That's my opinion on that. For example, <clears throat> back in 1978, there was like one quarter of the amount of movies coming out as there are today. Today's movies that come out, they benefit from inflation, but at the same time, they face far bigger competition and far more competition than movies back in the 80s or the 70s did. Do we take that in consideration? How does that affect the dollar relevance of what comes out? On top of that, back in the early 80s or the 70s or whatever, even in the 90s, the video game market was nowhere near the size that it is today. Today, movies have to compete for entertainment dollars with people buying video games and staying home and playing video games. And that is not an insignificant small amount. That's a huge thing. That is a huge variable when considering what is it worth when somebody goes to the movies today. So I would contend that, look, you either take none of the variables into consideration and just take it at face value, which I believe is the best way to do it, or you have to take into consideration seven, eight, nine, ten different variables. You don't just cherry pick one variable and figure that into the equation. Either take them all or you take none of them and just take it as a face value. Because to take one variable over others is a, a misdirect. It's, it's a deceptive notion. Just taking one thing into consideration that has a cultural and, and a time and an era variance and ignoring all the other things that bring massive variances to the difficulty and the value of getting somebody out to the movie theater today. So, no, you shouldn't take, I, I firmly believe you should not take inflation into consideration. You should either take all the variables or take none of them. And I think the easiest and the most across the board way, remember, and going to the movies is more expensive now, all that, like, what is the value of a movie ticket in 1973 versus the value of a movie ticket today, and what variables do you take into consideration when addressing that value? Best thing to do is take face value, and that's what we do right now, and I believe that's why 
industry experts go, yeah, that's the best way for us to count it. And uh, that's the way it should be, in my opinion, at least at any rate, just my opinion. All right. <clears throat> David Crabtree writes, hey, John, Chucky is still the name of the doll in the new Child's Play movie, but he is the name of the AI software. Yeah, I got corrected on that. I thought they just changed the name of the doll, too. I thought the name of the doll was still was now called Buddy, but apparently the name of the doll is still Chucky. The model is just Buddy. That's the software, that's the, the model of the toy, but his name is still Chucky. I said earlier that they changed his name to Buddy, but I stand corrected on that. It was absolutely that they changed his, his name is still Chucky. Uh, Phil Nguyen writes, uh, film recommendation, Return to Paradise with uh, Joaquin Phoenix. I do not believe I've seen that. You know what, let me look this up quick here. Uh, what is it? Return to Paradise 2? Or ret return to Paradise. Let's see if I can find this. Return to Paradise from 1998. Oh, Vera Fumia, Vince Vaughn, Joaquin Phoenix made $8 million at the box office. I, I, I'm not familiar. I don't know that I've ever heard of this film. Look at that. I, I can't recall this show. It was directed by Joseph Rubin. Jada Pinkett Smith was also in it. I mean, there's a lot of well-known people in there, and I'm familiar with Joseph Rubin, but... I, I'm not familiar with this film. Thank you for the recommendation. But apparently you're one of the, the only eight people in the world that saw it. Uh, Darren TV 100 writes, Hey, John, coming from the UK, is it time for Captain Britain? Uh, Marvel can dust him down, give him a pint of warm bitter uh, with a roast beef dinner and set loose on some baddies. A right royal spanking. Um, Why not? I mean, look, we're getting into an era now <laughs> where Marvel is wanting to... Oh not just wanting to, but needing to, uh, they're looking to expand their roster at this point. Captain Britain is definitely an option. They'll never call him Captain Britain. I mean, we got Captain America, we got Captain Marvel, we're going to add a third captain to that, so I, I don't know. But why not? Like, there's some interesting iterations of Captain Britain, and you could take a shot at that, so... I, pardon me, maybe once they get the X-Men, if you know Captain Britain, you know the tie to the X-Men. Um, maybe once they start folding in, maybe they'll wait on that till they start folding in X-Men stuff, which is a possibility too. But I'd say, why not? Bring him in. Why not? Bring him in. It's time for some new blood, and it looks like they're going to do that now. Uh, Joseph Mitchell writes, not necessarily based on the movies or TV or comics, but overall, who are your top five favorite superhero movies? Uh, mine would go Batman, TMNT, Spider, uh, Deadpool, and Iron Man. Just so you know, Joseph, I generally don't like to take top five or top ten. I don't like taking those questions uh, just because I'd have to. those are the things I have to sit down and work out and list out and whatever. So, But I will tell you this. My all-time favorite comic book character and right up there amongst my favorite movie characters as well is Eric. It's, it's Magneto. Magneto is my all-time favorite comic book character. I, he, the way he's been portrayed in different ways, uh, he's a multidimensional character with multi-motivations I just love this guy. And it really came to a peak when the comic book storyline Age of Apocalypse came out, where Magneto was actually the leader of the X-Men. And, and his love was Rogue. Rogue? Yep, his love was Rogue. And they had a baby. They had a baby? Yep. But wait, how does Rogue have sex? Magneto created a microscopic electric electromagnetic field around his body basically giving him a static cling condom. Basically, that's what it is. But anyway, all that ridiculousness aside, it's the greatest storyline ever in the history of comics to me. And yeah, so that for that reason, many others, Magneto is my all-time favorite comic book character. All time. All right, SJ writes, uh, what's going on with Ad Astra? Well, it's supposed to come out in May. For those of you who don't know, Ad Astra is this movie that's supposed to star Brad Pitt and Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones was, eight years and years ago, went off on, a, I believe, to Neptune, I think was where he was flying off to. Anyway, on a mission, a one-way trip to Neptune, but he was never heard from again. Now, decades later, Brad Pitt goes on a mission to try to figure out what happened to him. Something like that. I, whatever. The movie's supposed to come out in May. We haven't got a trailer for it yet, and it's supposed to come out in 23 days. 23 days is when it's supposed to come out. Still no trailer. I So unless Ad Astra is adopting the Robert Meyer Burnett marketing philosophy of just don't put out any trailers. 
unless that is what's going on, this movie's they're going to be announcing in the coming days that Ad Astra has been bumped. Yeah, I, I just don't see how they're releasing this movie on the 24th. If they are, shocking. I have, a, I, but I mean, this is coming out in 23 days. We haven't had a single trailer, not a single ad. I don't see how they're still going to do this. Unless they're trying something different with their marketing. They wanted to wait till maybe Endgame finished its first week and then do a hardcore campaign. Maybe it's possible. Right now, if I had to bet $2, I would bet the fact that we're going to get an announcement pretty soon that they're bumping the release date to later in the year or maybe even in 2020. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Joseph Mitchell writes, um, doesn't have to be DC versus Marvel. If DC makes great movies, Marvel will strive to make even better movies and vice versa, win-win for us all. It's even more than that. What Marvel does has no impact at all on what DC does or vice versa. DC is either it's going to make a movie and it's either going to be good or it's going to be not good. And Marvel's going to make movies and they're either going to be good or they're going to be not good. It, this isn't like a competition where one team is playing offense and the other team's playing defense. They can both win. They can both lose. They can have one win or the other win. I mean, either or. But it's not a competition. And, you know, Kevin Feige has come out multiple times and said, you know, we cheer for DC films to do well because if they do well, that means the health of the comic book genre is doing great and we live in the health, in the comic book genre. That's great for us. And I think he's absolutely right about that. So yeah, it's not a Marvel versus DC thing as much as some people continue to try to make it like that. But I feel, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like in the last six months or so, I feel like, the comic book movie fandom has evolved a little bit because I don't see nearly not. I mean, it's still there. I'm not in denial. It's still there, but I don't see nearly as much as that toxic DC versus Marvel DC corporate slave boys versus Marvel corporates. I don't see as much as that anymore. I almost feel like the, the, the comic book movie fandom has advanced a little bit, which is really encouraging. Now I, it, I still see it out there, but I think it's to a lesser degree than it was before, which is a really cool thing to see. All right. Uh, final question of the day. Uh, Melvin Rosa writes, maybe Disney should just go out and buy Hulu too. Hulu is pretty good streaming already. Uh, they can probably afford it with the earnings from Endgame. And I'll tell you right now, Disney can't afford lunch right now. Disney just spent over half of their corporate value, $71 billion buying Fox. They spent over $20 billion more than they initially wanted to pay. Because remember, they were going to pay something like 50 something billion to buy Fox. And then Comcast came in and said, oh yeah, we'll pay $60 billion. And they forced Disney to pay almost $20 billion more than they wanted to, to buy Fox. But they did. Half of their corporate net value. That was huge. They're not going to be buyers for a while. Disney's not going to be buyers. But <coughs> by buying Fox... They are now a controlling partner of Hulu. They own two-thirds of Hulu, essentially. Maybe not exactly two-thirds, but they are the majority controlling interest in Hulu right now. So they don't own Hulu outright, but they are the majority owners at this point. So they don't need to buy anything else at this point. They're really not in the position to do a lot of buying at the moment. Uh, all right, guys, that's it for today's installment of the companion video. We are now all caught up. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this. Don't forget, guys, the John Campus Show returns tomorrow with me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and Ashley Whaley. Make sure you come on back. We're already working on some stories and topics we're talking for tomorrow. We hope you're there to join us as well. That'll do it for now, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia, and until our next video, bye-bye.